with Amy Lee and Johnny Blair. takes the stand again after sacking her legal team. Dawn disruption. Police in Middlesbrough made two arrests in a series of early morning raids aimed at tackling child exploitation. Young lads typically don't know any better, see it as a, an opportunity to make quick, easy, ca quick, easy cash, um, be influenced by the peers and have a bit of street credit. So we'll find that it's very easy for organised crime groups to uh, get in a hold of these young lads and exploit them. 55 years and counting, Newcastle United's wait to win a major trophy continues as they're dumped out of the FA Cup by Manchester City. And top of the class, the teachers who are finally graduating from university, decades after completing their course. First tonight, a mother accused of killing her three-year-old son at their County Durham home has taken the stand again after dismissing her legal team. Christina Robinson from Ushermore has been accused of being responsible for the death of toddler Jelania in November 2022, a charge she denies. Our correspondent Tom Barton has been following the case for us at Newcastle Crown Court. Tom, first of all, talk us through what's happened today. Well, Amy, today the jury were met with the sight of an empty bench where Christina Robinson's legal team has been sat for the last three weeks of this trial. On Friday, she parted company with her solicitors and barristers. And today, the judge, Mr Justice Garnham, reminded the jury that this is her right and said they must not hold that against her in any way. Now, after giving nearly nine hours of evidence last week, she took the stand again today to give additional evidence. The court's previously been told that Dulani had died as a result of a major head injury, but that he also had severe burns on his body that hadn't been treated professionally. Now, Christina Robinson told the jury today that her treatment of those burns at home had been praised by an expert at a previous family court hearing. She also said that Dulania often bumped into things and banged his head and that he had appointments with eye specialists. She said, we cannot say either way what effect it could have had over time, whether he was at higher risk of having something happen. And Tom, the jury heard from the judge as well today. Yeah, that's right, Amy. Setting out legal directions today, Mr Justice Garnham told the jury that while this case will cause strong emotions, he said they must not judge it on the basis of feeling or sympathy or any emotional reaction you may have. The jury have been told they'll be asked to consider a charge of murder or an alternative charge of manslaughter, as well as four additional charges of child cruelty. All of those charges are denied by Christina Robinson. The trial will continue tomorrow. Our correspondent, Tom Barton, thank you. Next tonight to the early morning raids in Middlesbrough and Stockton in a bid to crack down on child exploitation. Two people were arrested on weapons and drugs offences in the operation that's meant to disrupt gangs grooming children into working for them. Our correspondent, Chris Jepson, was out with the police early this morning. Cleveland police on the hunt for organised crime groups in Middlesbrough, suspected of committing child exploitation. Police! An early knock at the door, evidence collected, but nobody's here to be arrested. Intelligence led, it's never a certainty they'll find who they're looking for, but officers say they're seeing child exploitation on a daily basis with some as young as 14 being safeguarded over drugs offences. Organised crime group will groom, exploit younger males that are in the area with uh, promises of you know, cash, mobile phones, new clothing, um, street credit even. And a lot of the time we've seen these young lads uh, using cannabis, etc. They'll promise them that, give them that to uh, supply drugs on their behalf. 
A few hours later, another team enter a Stockton property. Arrests are made, drugs and weapons found. Again, no children here, but the people arrested will be questioned to see if young people are part of this alleged group. There's a local organised crime group that were uh, recruiting children to um, traffic drugs in and around the area together with some vulnerable adults, and that's why it's known locally as the Chuggy in a hotspot for the child exploitation. Officers say it's important adults report suspected sexual and criminal exploitation of children because it can happen anywhere. The children don't realise that they're being exploited because they think that they've got mates and it's the mates that they're hanging about and doing favours for. So we don't, we struggle sometimes to get that exploitation disclosure. So we gather intelligence by the multi-agency forums that we're in, by police officers out on the street, social workers and the organised crime groups that we've identified and we watch them to see, you know, like who they're using to do X, Y and Z for. They've taken drugs and violent weapons off the streets today and raids like these could potentially help safeguard children from exploitation too. Chris Jepson, ITV News, Teesside. Time for more of the day's other news now. And a, and a lockdown at a school in Hartlepool has been lifted this evening after threats to two boys were allegedly made by a former pupil. Police attended the incident at St Hild School and pupils remained inside until it was deemed to be safe for them to leave. Officers are working with the school and the local community to ensure everyone's safety and offer reassurance. Two men who died at a property in Hartlepool have been named. 36-year-old Peter Cook was found dead following an incident at Eagles Cliff Road on Friday evening, along with his 68-year-old father, also named Peter Cook. A 39-year-old woman arrested on suspicion of murder remains on police bail while inquiries continue. Police in North Yorkshire say the family of Claudia Lawrence have suffered pain and despair since she went missing 15 years ago. The chef who worked at York University would have celebrated her 50th birthday last month. She disappeared on her way to work. Officers say the case is still being investigated. Levelling up Minister and Redcar MP Jacob Young was in Durham today to sign an expanded devolution deal which will give more powers to local council leaders. The leaders of seven councils from Northumberland to Durham joined Mr Young to launch the deal. It gives them the right to make broader decisions over transport and housing. It comes days after MPs from the Public Accounts Committee said there have been astonishing delays over the delivery of levelling up projects. A criticism which the Minister told us is unfair. What I'd say is, obviously buildings don't go up overnight and there's obviously a process that needs to happen to get there. But levelling up more broadly, I mean, this is levelling up. The fact that we're announcing this devolution deal today, giving the North East more powers over uh, the things that matter to people here. You're watching ITV News Time T is still to come on tonight's programme. Back to class, the teachers being recognised with their university degrees after decades in the profession. And a mild start to the week with plenty of spring sunshine in the mix. Change on the way, though, from the west. How's this cloud going to affect things going forward? I'll have your forecast later. Next tonight, to the 50,000 people in the northeast waiting to see an eye doctor and the high street opticians who say they're ready and willing to help clear the backlog. And they say they could offer routine appointments and cut NHS waiting lists, helping to stop some cases of preventable sight loss. Here's Catherine Walker. Professional artist Andrew is lucky that he can still see to paint after being diagnosed with an eye condition called AMD. His disease can be slowed down with regular injections every four weeks. But his first appointment was delayed causing irreversible sight loss. When, I've ex when I have experienced delays, um, I've noticed a, a decrease in my eyesight, in my left eye. Um, and anything you lose, you don't get back. You just don't get it back. It's very scary. My biggest fear is that I'll go blind. The latest figures from the health authorities in our region show it's a widespread problem, with more than 50,000 people on the waiting list to see an NHS eye doctor. Over 1,000 of those have been waiting for more than a year. 
So how are you feeling at the moment, Barry? To help clear the backlog, the industry body for eye care professionals say high street opticians could take on some of those patients. An optometrist in the community is not just someone who sells glasses. It's really important to understand they undergo further qualifications. They are able to uh, differentiate between eye diseases, different types like cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration. So optometrists, I think, in the, the community are definitely, uh, without doubt, undervalued and underutilised. Under the current system, some opticians can offer enhanced services, but it's a postcode lottery. In Peter Lee, Adam Smith says all optometrists should be able to offer routine care for local NHS patients. So we can triage them, see them and then refer on in an appropriate timescale with our equipment and specialist skills that we've got compared to see, seeing a GP colleague who they have a pressure that they can't cope with their patients and we're not really being used at the moment in some areas of the country. In a statement, the government told ITV News that cutting waiting lists is one of our top priorities. NHS England is looking at how more patients can be managed in the community, freeing up capacity at hospital eye services. But at the moment, England is the only country in the UK without a national eye strategy. And patients like Andrew say it's time to focus on a clear plan to stop preventable sight loss. Catherine Walker, ITV News. And the ITV Evening News continues at 6.30. Here's Mary. Coming up on the programme, Vladimir Putin threatens protesters in Russia with punishment after he wins his fifth term in office. The morning comes after his landslide victory, condemned as a sham by some world leaders. Also on the programme, two years after the mass sacking of nearly 800 P&O ferry workers, IP News discovers the company is still paying some of its seafarers less than half the minimum wage. And it is the end of the road for Britain's most successful female Olympian. If you join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Now Simon has joined us in the studio to look back on the weekend sport. <laughs> And there'll be at least another year without silverware at St James's Park. Newcastle United out of the FA Cup, Simon. Yes, to no one's great surprise, they were beaten by the best team in the world. It's 55 years and counting for the Lancer Trophy in the St James's Park cabinet. Manchester City rarely go more than 55 days without winning one at the moment. A bit of a damp squib in the end as Newcastle's last hope of silverware for yet another year disappeared in the Manchester rain. Newcastle United fans are all too familiar with the phrase, but it's time to concentrate on the league. Still another year without silverware, isn't it? Yeah, it is, but I don't think we could feel sorry for ourselves or have that kind of emotion that's happened. Um, this season could have ended up very different. It seems that the big moments have just gone against us, but uh, we have to take responsibility for that. City are the best team in the land and indeed all the world and they hadn't lost a game at home this season before Saturday. The near 8,000 travelling Newcastle fans knew this was a long shot. The disappointment is there was no sense of jeopardy, no suggestion an upset was in the air. The Magpies honestly didn't play badly, they were just overmatched. There was an element of luck about both Bernardo Silva's goals which were both deflected. But City didn't need luck, they would have scored more if they'd needed to. The game effectively ended in this moment, when Alexander Isak failed to take Newcastle's only real clear-cut chance. They got nowhere near Manchester City on Saturday, and the obvious truth is that on and off the pitch, the Magpies are nowhere near Manchester City by any measurement. Newcastle United's ownership has said ultimately they want the Magpies to be the number one club in the world. Well, here tonight, against the current undisputed number one club in the world, Newcastle United saw just how far they have to go if they're going to get anywhere near achieving that end. Yeah, I think I think this summer has got to be a big change. We are in, we are out. Hopefully next year more signings, more to come. I mean, we have come a long way, but we've still got a long way to go as well. And we know that, you know, the fans know that. If you feel nervous, I think we we'll actually realise that in any case. It was never going to happen overnight. That's FFP, isn't it? What do we do? To restrict it massively. We've got to do what else, but what can we do? 
It's going to be a long road, isn't it? Massive. Massive. I think we've got some lads that think it's going to happen overnight, and it's not. It's not. Oh, yeah. We're ahead of schedule. We're just having a good time. So now what? Newcastle have 10 games to earn some sort of European place and a whole lot of lessons to learn. How to deal with Europe, how to deal with injuries. If it's any consolation, football's finest mind thinks Newcastle will learn. Newcastle, they, they, they bring it another step, another level was there, and, but it's the first time that they play for competitions. And that is when it's the first time, it's not easy for any club. I'm pretty sure they will take a lessons about that. But people say our season's over and it's... That's absolute nonsense as far as I'm concerned. There'd be no uh, negativity from me um, or from the players. We know the importance of representing the club well in every single game and every single moment. There was no shame losing here, but there was disappointment. Of course there was. Last season was a dream for Newcastle fans. Reality has bit back to some extent this season. But still they come with their unconditional love. And really, after this many years without a trophy, what's one more? Well, away from the FA Cup, it was a festival of the goalless, with score sheets remaining blank all over the place. It finished nil-nil at the Riverside, as Middlesbrough failed to see off Blackburn Rovers, and as a result, lost ground in the Championship playoff race. This was an OK goalless draw, as goalless draws go. There were chances at both ends. Borough's Isaiah Jones hit the crossbar in the dying seconds, and the rebound went begging. It was a frustrating day for Michael Carrick and his team. Now, the best you can say about events at the Stadium of Light is that Sunderland stopped the rot, but they did so in a truly rotten game. Queen's Park Rangers had the best of what chances there were, and the Black Cat season continues to die a slow and painful death, but at least they avoided a seventh defeat in a row. And the hits, or rather the misses, kept on coming. Harrogate also played out a goalless draw away at Barrow in League Two. Harrogate keeper James Belshaw was the hero. He saved Dean Campbell's first half penalty. Hartlepool also had a goalless draw with South End in the National League. There were goals in Gateshead's game, too many of them for Gateshead's liking. Rob Elliott's team had a man sent off early on and lost 4 2 at Ebsbury. Only one goal at York, a late one that beat Aldershot and boosted the Minster men's chances of avoiding relegation. In the Women's Championship, Sunderland suffered a setback to their promotion hopes. They lost to the only goal of the game away to London City Lionesses. Defeat for Durham as well. They lost 1 0 at home to Charlton. Newcastle United women won at Wolves and they are closing in on promotion from the Northern Premier League. Away from football, not a great weekend for the Eagles who lost at home to Sheffield Sharks in the British Basketball League. Four Newcastle players represented the North yesterday in the All-Star Game in London, but in a blow for the idea of levelling up, the South won. Finally from me, congratulations to the Billingham Stars. Their win at Hull on Saturday confirmed them as champions of ice hockey's Morally North League. Simon, thank you very much indeed. And we'll go from the sporting field to the actual fields where the food that goes on our plates is produced. Yes, there is a school of thought that with the average age of farmers here pushing 60, bringing agriculture into the curriculum might help to grow a new generation of recruits. Nick Smith has more. Young farmers like Rebecca Wilson from Boroughbridge in North Yorkshire are an increasingly rare breed. Government figures show that just 3% of those running a farm are under 35, while more than a third are now beyond retirement age. And Rebecca admits those who aren't born into farming families like she was can struggle to find ways into the industry. Young people probably don't necessarily see farming as a career. It can seem very difficult, long hours, challenging kind of realities. You know, we're in the lambing shed now and it's not always an easy day in here. The money side of farming is also really, really tricky. We can't necessarily pay people coming into the industry a fair wage. So if you're not born into it and your family aren't farming, there's a lot of jobs out there which look a lot more tempting. United Nations research claims the UK needs to double its food production by 2050, and efforts are underway to recruit new blood. Are you ready? That's as straight as a roundabout! Amazon Prime's Clarkson's Farm introduced millions to Caleb Cooper. Jeremy's right-hand man, 
guiding the presenter as he tries his own hand at working the land. Um, I love the cows, I love the arable side and growing wheat. The 25-year-old has always wanted to work on farms, and he tells me he's now using his profile to inspire more youngsters to consider it as a career. I firmly believe you should be teaching farming as a, a GCSE. It should be maths, English, science, farming. That's what I think personally. I would, I would, I would, I would have gone to school more then. <laughs> There's always a job in, in agriculture. For example, if you come out of A-stars and you're really good with science, you can go and sit down on the agronomy side of the industry and start maybe developing crops to grow better in different climates. Or you could become an engineer. Or you become a farmer yourself. There's so many different job opportunities out there. I firmly believe we should be you know, teaching farming in school. But we make hay in the summer. It smells lovely. We farm cows, cattle, and we grow crops. So the cows that we produce uh, will go for beef production. So if you've eaten a McDonald's, you've probably eaten some of the cows from my farm. The National Farmers Union is encouraging farmers to visit schools under a scheme to raise pupil awareness about where food comes from. I guess you never really think about farming because to us, food is from the supermarket. So this assembly today kind of made you think of like where your origins of food come from. It's not really a well-spoken career path and actually today really made me think it should be more spoken about in schools because I think it would be a really good career path to go into. Farming still has perceptions of being an ageing profession, facilitating our food's journey from field to fork. But young farmers with a passion for their vocation or a mission to change that, to try to sustain their industry for new generations. Nick Smith, ITV News. Now to a group of teachers who left the classroom behind many years ago, but have now been recognised for their studies and for their years of service. Yes, Sunderland University has presented honorary degrees to those who qualified from a former teaching college in the city. At the time, their studies were not degree subjects, but all that has changed as Helen Ford reports. Graduation normally marks the start of a student's career. Today, at a ceremony in Sunderland, 120 teachers are gathered to celebrate a lifetime of work and to receive honorary Bachelor of Education degrees. At the time they studied, they were awarded a Certificate of Education. The University of Sunderland felt it was high time for an upgrade. Those teachers have given such a lot back to our region and yet they have not been afforded the opportunity to study for a degree. And as other universities were doing this retrospectively, we thought it would be a really nice thing to do to celebrate those staff who have given so much to the region. The former students all studied at Sunderland College of Education Teacher Training College. It was based here at Langham Tower. After a series of changes over the decades, the college eventually became part of the university. Among those receiving a retrospective degree, Graham Fraser, who studied at the college between 1966 and 69. Like many others, he stayed in the city to teach, becoming head of three schools. There'll be people here that you know well, others that you haven't seen for many years. Overall, what's the atmosphere been like today? Full of enthusiasm, full of joy. Everybody's happy. Every, everybody has appreciated what the university has done today because it's been a long time coming. Studying at the same time as Graham was Bridget Andrews, who also collected her honorary degree. The pair were instrumental in contacting other former students to spread the word about today's ceremony. We've all finished our careers long ago, and um, it was just such a nice surprise, and, and indeed an honor. So yes, we were all thrilled. A lot of us have stayed in contact for a long, long time, so it was lovely to see everybody that we still knew and remembered together. Today's audience was told the new graduates had a combined experience of thousands of years. And while they may not be teaching any longer, it's fair to say they've shaped the lives of many others living and working in the city today. Helen Ford, ITV News, Sunderland. Yeah, such a special day. Congratulations to everybody who graduated. Amazing stuff. Yeah. We're joined now by uh, Ross, another expert in the field. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the weather, weather's turned a little.
an expert in the temperature today. Good, good. It was mild. It there you was, go. Yeah. Can I get a degree? Yeah. Probably not. Um, yeah, it's been mild. It's been like spring at the moment. There you go. That's what you want to see, isn't it? Uh, 15.2 degrees in North Yorkshire was our top temperature today. The average for this time of year is around 10. Maybe making the most of that extra little bit of daylight. Have you noticed it's creeping in? Picking Sunderland here, sunset was officially just a couple of minutes ago, giving us the first day since September that our day was longer than our night. Today we have 12 hours, 14 minutes, and around 9 seconds of daylight uh, between sunrise and sunset. That is four and a half minutes longer than we had yesterday, so that's good news. Oh, that's a lot. It's creeping up about four and a half minutes uh, per day for the next few weeks, actually. Yeah. Feeling mild at the moment, but yeah, just a reminder this time of year, there's a bit of a sting in its tail. It will turn colder towards the end of the week, is your forecast. It's looking like a chilly one. Tui sponsors ITV Time Tees Weather. Some good spells of sunshine for us today, of course, feeling mild with that, but the cloud is starting to increase. That's the sign of things to come overnight. We are looking at some patchy rain, sometimes on the heavier side, but it clears through tomorrow morning, leaving us again with sunny spells in these mild conditions and setting us up for a changeable week up and down through the next few days. There's the rain that's moving through overnight, moving up from the southwest, clearing up towards the northeast through tomorrow morning. Behind that, things calming down for a time. Brighter skies, a scattering of showers, but then again into Wednesday, further area of rain moving up from the southwest. Because of this direction, the heaviest rain for often filtered out by the higher ground, patchier for us the further east you go. In fact, that's what we're seeing as we head through this evening and overnight. You can see the rain arriving, the heaviest bursts tending to be over the Pennines. Winds picking up at times, breezy into the early hours. And with all this going on, again, those temperatures really holding up. The overnight lows around 9 or 10 degrees, but those where they should be by day at this time of year. So again, we know it's a mild start going into tomorrow morning. First thing, quite a bit of clouds around and some patchy rain, but by around 8, 9 o'clock, most of that has cleared away. Now, we will see a few showers bubbling up through the day, and with lighter breezes, some of these slow moving. But in between, again, we get those sunny skies, temperatures on the milder side, 14, maybe 15 degrees as we head into the afternoon. Through Tuesday and into Wednesday, similar to what we're seeing tonight as we head through the evening and overnight, the cloud is going to thicken and we see that patchy rain arriving. The heavier bursts occasionally clearing their way out towards the east behind that things, gradually brightening up from the west. Tui sponsors ITV Time Tees Weather. Thank you, Ross. In just a moment, the national and the international news. And I'm back here with a late update for you tonight at half past ten. I hope to see you then. We'll see you again tomorrow. Take care. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.